So now we have this mystery of all of these active galactic nuclei showing different kinds of properties. We've got blazars and radio galaxies and seaforts and quasars. And how does it all fit together? Is this just a you know, crazy array of different phenomena? Or is there really one underlying mechanism that somehow is exhibiting different kinds of properties? Right? That's really in science what you hope for. We hope that we see, you know, uh, that we can take the diversity of phenomena and find some unifying uh, way of explaining it. And that certainly has happened with uh, active galactic nuclei. So, um, the important thing to understand is what, what are the sort of general characteristics of AGN? Well, they're compact in size. They tend to generate um, outflows at very high velocities, even the speed, you know, close to the speed of light. Uh, so they're very relativistic. Um, they, emit, uh, they emit light at a variety of wavelengths, right? We've seen everything from radio to x-rays. Um, and they tend to be at the center of galaxies. So uh, out of this, people can back out certain unifying characteristics. Since the jets are relativistic, the beams of gas are relativistic, they must be coming from something that is itself relativistic. Um, and that tells us, and also the small size scale of these things, uh, and one way we can tell that they really are, but the regions where these jets are coming from or where all the energy is coming from must be very small, is the variability. The fact that the variation sometimes is so fast that it must be associated with a small object. So you put that together, we, got, uh, we need something very small and we need it to boost things up to uh, relativistic speeds. And that leads us to the idea that it's supermassive black holes, that it's, it's black holes at the center of, the, of these uh, galaxies, just like you know, at the center of our own galaxy, that that's really the engine powering active galactic nuclei. So as gas falls inward towards the black hole, if there's gas available, then it's going to be, as we've talked about before, the friction between the materials, the tidal forces, um, that as it falls in, of course, before it gets to the event horizon, that's where the energy is going to be coming from. And the jets that we see are coming from the accretion disk of, of material that forms as material spirals in towards the black hole. And we've already seen how jets can form from accretion disks when we looked at young stellar objects. So anytime you form an accretion disk, you're likely to get a jet forming. In this case, because it's close to a black hole and you need to escape from the uh, regions close to a black hole, the speeds are naturally going to be close to the escape speed, which is going to be close to the speed of light. So, you know, supermassive black holes are really at the root of the AGN phenomena, the active galactic nuclei phenomena. Um, and the reason why we, do all, you know, we don't see lots of, you know, why, why every galaxy doesn't have an active of galactic nuclei is because it's just a matter of whether or not there's enough mass there. There has to be a lot of gas available to funnel into the black hole in order to produce um, the kinds of emission that we see. So really what we're also learning about here is the fact that as galaxies evolve, um, we expect that perhaps they, they, or that, that they will all go through a, a quasar-like phase, an active galactic nuclear-like phase. But once they run out of material in the central regions, as has happened in our own galaxy, then they quiet down. Um, so uh, how does this help us tell the difference between all of the different kinds of active galactic nuclei? Remember, we had the radio galaxies, the quasars, the, the uh, seaforts, etc. And it really turns all out to be orientation. So what we imagine is, is that we have um, you know, a central black hole, and then we have a disk around it. And then around that, people have hypothesized that there's actually sort of a ring of molecular gas, a dense ring, sort of, you know, sort of quite fat. Now, it all, what matters is, is whether or not um, that ring is tilted towards you or perpendicular to your line of sight. And if it's perpendicular to the line of sight, then you're not going to be able to see through it. You may not see some of the central regions, but you will see the jets beaming up uh, uh, on the plane of the sky. However, if the entire system is tilted right at you, then the jet is going to be coming right at you. You won't necessarily see the jet uh, directly, um, but you will be able to peer right down into the, central, uh, the center of the whole region uh, or the center of the whole system. And so, um, you know, you're going to see a lot more uh, energetic phenomena as well. So really, it turns out that with just these, these unifying, uh, this unifying model of a torus, a molecular torus, an accretion disk, and a supermassive black hole, we're able to actually embrace all of the phenomena, all of the different types of active galactic nuclei. And when you come up with something like that as a scientist, you get really excited because you found, a, you found simplicity in complexity. Um, and that's what every scientist is looking for, whether they're biologists, sociologists, or physicists. So uh, now that we've seen that you know supermassive black holes occur in all galaxies and that they are responsible for uh, the amazing active galactic nuclei phenomena, we can ask the question, what came first, the galaxy or the supermassive black hole? And that's a really interesting question that people are still working on. Um, one thing that we found is there's a clear correlation between the mass of the bulge and the supermassive black hole um, mass. Um, and that's an interesting thing because the, the black hole is really 
really, you know, it's a small piece of the entire mass of the galaxy, uh, and it's a very small location, you know, very takes up a very small amount of space relative to the rest of the galaxy. So these correlations that we find between bulge mass and black hole mass, or also between the average rotation speed in the outer regions of the galaxy and the supermassive black hole mass, are, are, are hard initially to understand. Um, so people call this the M sigma relationship, these relationships between the mass of the black hole and say um, the rotation rate. So how do we put this together? Well, the theory that we're working with now, and there's still a lot of work to be done, is that the um, supermassive black hole and the bulge must have formed together. That the, the processes that shaped them were sort of coeval, as we like to say. So again, there's a lot of work that still has to be done on this, but there is a clear relationship between the mass of the black hole and the properties of the galaxy around it. So, so it really is telling us that there was, there's, there's a connection. You know, the, the correlation points to a connection between their, their evolution.